morning, everybody, and thank you all for <clears throat> for joining us for a very uh, special one. I'm sure it will be a very interesting uh, event. The dialogue is extremely happy and proud uh, to be collaborating in this uh, event and in this project um, with La Pop, the Latin American Public Opinion Project that uh, I think all of you uh, are probably familiar with. They're an indispensable uh, resource and reference uh, about public opinion. Uh, and the America's Barometer, I think, is something that I, everybody reads. And uh, I think uh, it's, an, it's a very, very important tool for uh, research, policy analysis, and, uh, and, and recommendations as well. So we're thrilled uh, to be collaborating uh, in this special report um, that we worked on uh, together beneath the violence, how insecurity shapes life and immigration in Central America. Um, we know that there's enormous attention uh, uh, about um, uh, violence in especially the Northern Triangles in Central America, Northern Triangle countries in Central America. And uh, what's often talked about is uh, the levels of homicides. But I think uh, uh, more rarely do uh, analysts look beneath, below uh, and beneath those uh, those data um, to see to look at behavioral patterns um, and uh, people who are uh, live in fear and tremendous insecurity and behave in a certain way to avoid uh, violence, which has implications, uh, serious implications for the rule of law, for economic development, for immigration, uh, and therefore should be taken into very careful account in um, any policy uh, analysis uh, and recommendations. So this morning, we're going to um, talk about the report and discuss uh, some of its findings and how they could be useful for decision makers and policy makers uh, who are trying to uh, address uh, issues of violence and also migration uh, and how to manage it more effectively, those issues more effectively. Um, the the uh, report that you have available was uh, written, uh, again, this is in collaboration, and Ben Radistoff, who's back there, who is a program associate here at the Dialogue, uh, Carol Wilson, who's here with us from La Pop, uh, uh, Liz Zekmeister, who's with La Pop, and Michael Camilleri, who is the um, who is our director of our uh, Peter Bell Rule of Law program uh, here at the Dialogue. So this was a real, genuine, uh, collaborative effort, and uh, we want to congratulate them on a great report. And um, what we'll do is to um, begin with Liz, who can tell us a little bit about um, about La Pop and and try to put this issue in some perspective and some context. Uh, she is, Liz is the Cornelius uh, Vanderbilt Professor of Political Science. She's at Vanderbilt University, and she's a director uh, of La Pop. She has uh, uh, spoken at the dialogue before, and we're thrilled to have her back with us again. Uh, Carol Wilson is the senior data an analyst and researcher uh, for La Pop, um, and she will talk about some of the methodological questions that, uh, uh, that were behind this uh, important study. Uh, again, Michael uh, will also talk about the study. He's a rule of law director here at the Dialogue, and we're absolutely thrilled and uh, delighted to have a, a good friend uh, as a co to comment and, and share some thoughts on the report, uh, Juan Gonzalez, who currently is the associate vice president at the Cone Group, uh, but he formerly served as deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for Central America and the Caribbean. So thank you, Juan for agreeing to come by and share some thoughts, really to Juan's role will really be to begin the uh, discussion uh, with, all, with, uh, with all of you. And then we'll open up to your comments and questions. So again, thank you very much for coming. And Liz, thank you. And the floor is yours. Thinking about this issue, thinking about how we could uh, 
advance uh, knowledge and, and uh, understandings and also data on this topic. Uh, so we're just really appreciative and, and glad to be here today to, uh, to can I say, okay, all right, oh, well, yeah, that works. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the idea is to get beneath the violence and to get beneath the violence uh, we need an instrument that provides systematic and reliable data on how citizens experience and respond to insecurity and crime in their daily lives. And so to do that, we use data from the America's Barometer Project. This is LAPOP's biennial regular survey of the Americas. Uh, the most recent round of the Americas uh, Barometer covers 29 countries, includes over 43,000 interviews. Uh, that's the, the most recent round, but the project has been around since 2004, so about every two years we've gone into the field in up to 34 countries and conducted surveys to try to get at citizens' experiences, evaluations, assessments, preferences, and, and intentions on a variety of topics, including the topic that we're talking about today. The surveys are conducted in the Latin America and Caribbean region in face-to-face -face interviews in people's homes in the appropriate language using mobile devices for data collection in the field. The surveys are nationally representative, meaning that we conduct interviews in urban areas, in rural areas, we talk to rich people, we talk to poor people, uh, we draw a nationally representative sample by way of scientific means for sample design, peer-reviewed samples, and in so doing, we draw what we, what, what we you know, sort of can have confidence in as a representative portrait of that, of that country. All our data and reports written by LAPOP on this project are available on our project website for free download. So you can access the raw data files, you can access the data in, through an interactive tool that we have, and you can also download reports there. This, i go back slide, this is what the 2016-17 round of the America's Barometer looks like in terms of the data set. So we covered 29 countries this past round. We conducted interviews with a typical minimum of 1,500 individuals in each country. You can see there the sampling error estimates that we've uh, given you for each country. And we've written a report on some of the core themes that emerge from this extensive data collection. And that report is available on our project website. It's called The Political Culture of Democracy in the Americas 2016-17, a comparative study of democracy and governance. And there's also a hard copy uh, out in the lobby uh, for those who are here. Today, though, we're going to focus on our Central American surveys. Uh, so that's these surveys at the top there. And I want to thank those who support this project, because it's not possible without the collaboration contributions, input, and so on from many, many people. So of course we're thankful to the dialogue for the partnership that we're sort of displaying today. We're also very grateful to USAID for their core partnership in, in the America's Barometer Project. We're, we work with the Inter-American Development Bank, we work with the UNDP, Vanderbilt University supports the project, and then we work with partners across the region so that in every country that we work in, we have local expertise input, which provides us a way to refine the questionnaires, make sure that the instruments are good instruments when they go into the field, but also provides us with avenues for disseminating results in country so that we're not only presenting results here in DC, but we're also going across the Americas after each round and presenting results in, in, in the countries from which we collected data. So it's tempting to take survey data just sort of off the shelf or out of reports at face value. But we know that not all surveys are the same. And not all survey projects are of the same quality. Therefore, not all survey data is of the same quality. So I just want to say a few words about what makes our project unique and uniquely reliable. One of the things that we do is we conduct extensive pretesting in every country that we work in. And this is qualitative pretesting. So we're contracting local firms, we're working with local partners, uh, but we're not asking them to pretest the questionnaire in the standard commercial way of pretesting, which would be to send that questionnaire out into the field, get some data back, analyze it, see that people responded to questions, you know, more or less maybe as we expected them to, and then we go ahead and declare the instrument done and ready for the field. Rather, what we do is we send teams out to conduct cognitive interviews, qualitative pretests. So what you see here on the slide is a one of our partners from the firm that we work with in, in Panama. 
talking to an individual who has her back to us about the, about the questions, asking her the questions and asking follow-up questions. Did that make sense? Would, it, would your answer be different if I asked it this way instead, right? It, thinking about the flow of the, of the questionnaire, the, the extent to which the person can understand the, the questions in the way that we intend them to be understood. And so what you can see if you look closely at this slide is that in the foreground, there's a, a piece of paper. That's the law pop individual, in this case one of our graduate students, standing there listening to the interview and ensuring that, that, that it's sort of going correctly, and if not, taking some notes so we can revise the, the instrument. Key to a high quality comparative project is that everything is standardized. Okay? So we conduct standardized training in every country, meaning that one of our team members, either one of our research staff, a graduate student, or an affiliate, trains each country team according to the same manual. That interviewer, interviewer manual is on our website. We standardize everything, the sample design, the instrument, the protocols, uh, the quality control. And this is important so that when you compare values that we give you for Guatemala to Honduras, you can have confidence that the difference you're seeing is due to a difference across those countries and not due to a difference across the way that the survey was implemented. As I mentioned, we also use electronic devices for data collection in the field. This is very uh, sort of modern, I guess. We, we've been at the frontier of this. It's also very important for uh, high quality survey research in, in challenging contexts in particular. The electronic devices give us a lot of data on the interview, what we call metadata. And with that metadata, we can check things, and we work with our partners in the field to do this. We can check that the interview takes place in the right location, that the interview is conducted by the right interviewer, the one who attended training, and that the interview uh, proceeds according to protocol. The questions are read in the right way, they're not read too fast they're read, uh, and so on. So we, we verify the, the data uh, as we go. So turning to the topic that we're here to talk about today, I want to just introduce the topic uh, with some statistics from the America's Barometer project uh, that give us a portrait of the region. Um, so the 2016-17 America's Barometer reveals to us a, a number of, of things that go beyond homicide data, but uh, reflect some of the things that we're seeing in, in, in homicide data on the region. Uh, first, insecurity is on the rise in Central America. Second, crime victimization has increased in Central America. Third, fear of homicide is very high in the Northern Triangle countries. Homicide awareness has also increased. So I'll talk a, in a minute about what homicide awareness is in the case of our survey. Let me start uh, by, by looking at the data with you on insecurity. So when I put up a chart like this, the dot is our point estimate, the gray bar is our confidence interval, standard for a survey since we're drawing a sample from, from the field, and then we're gonna tell you sort of this is the estimate, more or less, and the gray is that more or less, right? So what you're seeing here is the percentage of people in Central America who in each year from 2006 to our most recent round, which went across 2016 and 17, uh, responded to this question. I'm going to read the question, and I'll tell you what they responded. So speaking of the neighborhood where you live and the possibility of being assaulted or robbed, do you feel very safe, somewhat safe, somewhat unsafe, or very unsafe? And what we're showing you is the percentage of people, on average for the Central American region in each year, who responded very unsafe. And what you can see is that we had reached a sort of low point in 2012, and insecurity has been increasing since then. It was higher in 2014, and it's higher in this most recent round, returning to a level that we last saw in 2006 in the region. We also ask about crime victimization, and we find that crime victimization has also increased in the region, this time between 2014 and 2016-17, the most recent round. So in 2014, when we asked people, now changing the subject, have you been the victim of any type of crime in the past 12 months? That is, have you been the victim of a robbery, a burglary, an assault, fraud, blackmail, extortion, violent threats, or any other type of crime? Uh, yes or no, in the past 12 months, have you experienced this? We see that about one out of five individuals in the Central American region report in 2016-17 that they were, victim, they were the victim of at least one crime in the year prior. 
Now that's any type of crime. There is data out there on uh, homicide rates in the region, and we know that the Northern Triangle, the area that's lit up there in red in Central America, is an area that has seen comparatively high rates of homicide. And the survey, of course, cannot ask people about their direct experiences with homicide, uh, but we can ask about their sort of uh, fairly close to their direct experience, their awareness of homicides in their neighborhood. So are they aware in the past year of any homicides having occurred in their neighborhood? And we looked at this uh, for the Northern Triangle. We asked in, in two ways. Let me first do uh, their, their fear, the fear that they have themselves of being the victim of a homicide. So this one just asks about whether or not they have a lot of fear, some fear, little fear, no fear at all. And we find that over half of individuals in Northern Triangle countries have, uh, oops, I don't have my, let me go back. So over half of the of, of individuals that we surveyed have uh, some or uh, a lot of fear. Hang on, I'm trying to, oh, there. Okay, so that's this part of the, the pie right here, the darker purple in each country, the, that, those two segments take up more than half of, half of the pie. So in the Northern Triangle, more than one in two live in fear of being the victim of a homicide. Here's the data on homicide awareness in the neighborhood. So what we find when we ask people, have there been any murders in the last 12 months in your neighborhood? Uh, in 2014, in the Northern Triangle, on average, about a quarter of adults said they were aware of, of a homicide. And in 2016, 17, that's jumped up to be just over 33%, just over one in three. So what we do with the report is we take a look at crime avoidance as a coping strategy. We want to understand how this context of high and increasing crime, violence, and insecurity is affecting people's daily lives, social fabrics, economic outcomes, uh, and so on. And so we look at how people change their behavior to avoid becoming victimized by crime. We find that crime avoidance behaviors are prevalent. Crime avoidance is most common in the Northern Triangle. And crime avoidance affects daily lives through its consequences for education, communities, transportation, and the economy. So I'm going to briefly show you some of these data, and then I'll turn it over to Carol, who's going to continue on with our, our presentation of the report. So first, crime avoidance behaviors are prevalent in the region. We find uh, that there is a difference between the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, and the other three countries that we have in this report, uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And you can see that distinction by looking at the dark purple lines and the light purple lines in each graph. This is from a module where we ask people, out of fear of being a victim of crime, in the last 12 months, have you, and then we ask them, have you prevented children from playing in the street? And in the Northern Triangle, about two out of every three adults responds, yes, out of fear of crime, there's been a moment in the past 12 months or more than one moment when I pulled my you know, children or pulled children out of the street. Avoided leaving the house for fear of crime at night, uh, over one out of every two individuals. Avoided using public transportation for fear of crime. In the Northern Triangle, nearly one out of every two individuals says yes. It's one out of two, every, uh, one out of two individuals in Honduras, uh, and then slightly lower for the other two countries. Failed the need to move for uh, fear of crime out of one's neighborhood. Uh, you see that about uh, one out of every five individuals in the Northern Triangle responds affirmatively to that. We asked a series of questions just of those people in the Northern Triangle. This uh, module here about avoiding making purchases, uh, whether or not they've considered migrating because of insecurity, and whether or not they've changed jobs or school locations for fear of crime in the last year. And so these questions allow us to, to peel that uh, sort of uh, surface back again to get another look at the ways in which crime, insecurity, and violence are affecting societies, economies, uh, and polities in the Northern Triangle region. In Guatemala, we asked a question about whether or not the individual has kept children out of school for fear of crime. And we see that nearly one out of every thir three adults reports that during the last 12 months, at some point, they've pulled their children or kept their children from school out of fear of crime. So we take these data and we, we compile them into what we call a crime avoidance index. And I'm going to turn this over to Carol to talk about that crime avoidance index and uh, what we correlate it to. So 
So we set out to develop an index that combines the responses to those four questions that we uh, that we asked in all six uh, Central American countries to come up with a single numerical value that will represent or measure the extent to which an individual goes out of his or her way in response to crime. Um, so we did this. We created a scale then by combining these, these uh, responses to these questions and scaled on a 0 to 100. Um, we can compare the aggregate impact across the countries on this scale. And consistent with this, um, with what we would expect from such a measure, um, scores on this crime avoidance index, as we describe, are higher in the Northern Triangle um, and correlate with perceptions of insecurity, crime victimization, and gang presence. So this crime avoidance index then, here we show the distribution of the percentage of people who report in engaging um, some number of these behaviors that we've talked about, that Liz spoke about. Um, you can see here that a larger proportion of people in the Northern Triangle engage in all four behaviors and that a larger proportion outside of the Northern Triangle engage in no such behaviors. So we have, for example, it's kind of difficult to see because it almost blends into white, but the numbers beneath the um, will be able to help you uh, to see, for example, those in the Northern Triangle, more than almost a quarter of people engage in no such behavior, whereas in the Northern Triangle, uh, much fewer number of people engage in no such in, in no such behavior, crime avoidance behaviors. Um, and I keep pressing the wrong button. Sorry about that. Here we go. Um, and here we have show the average score by country in the region: um, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Obviously have. Higher, res higher index numbers than in Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, as we would expect if this is measuring something uh, that we think is, is, uh, is important. And then, but next I want to look at one of the important consequences of, of crime in the region, and that is uh, migration. And so I want to preview some of the findings that I'm going to discuss um, we find in general in the report, and, and as I'm going to show in the analysis, that insecurity motivates migration, that intentions to migrate have increased sharply in recent years, and that crime avoidance and crime victimizations are strong predictors of intentions to leave the country. About one in three have considered migrating because of insecurity specifically. Um, and we're looking right now at just the Northern Triangle. Um, and you can see it's highest in El Salvador and Honduras. And uh, Guatemala has significantly lower number of individuals saying that they would consider migrating because of insecurity. As we can see here, intentions to migrate in general have increased sharply in the region. Uh, you'll notice that there was a dip uh, between 2010 and 2012. But in every country except Nicaragua, intentions to migrate have uh, risen to their highest points. What we'd like to do in the next, uh, as, in, in, as we move on, is we want to see what factors are related to these intentions to migrate. What can we talk, what can we understand about why people 
consider migration and what role in particular does crime and crime avoidance have in understanding these intentions to migrate and how do these how can we compare these for example to other factors such as economic factors that are involved in people's decision making process to and and considerations for migration So what we did was we analyzed a number of individual level factors, including here indicators of crime and gang activity, trust assessments of the executive and of the police, experiences with police in corruption, perceptions of police responsiveness, interpersonal trust, and personal economic situations. So We've, we also included in our analysis a number of, of socio-demographic uh, factors such as age, education, gender, urban-rural location, um, for example. But what I want to show you here is uh, to understand this, this particular graph. So our dependent variable, or the, the, the factor that we want to explain is intention to migrate. So what are those factors then? How are these, how can we understand the, uh, uh, the impact of these factors on intention to migrate? And what you see, the little dots with the number above them are, is a regression coefficient uh, in the model. And the little uh, whiskers that extend from that are the standard errors. If those standard errors cross that red line at zero, it means that that's not a significant factor. Um, if they don't, then that is a statistically significant factor. We've scaled the dependent variable here, intentions to migrate, from on a likelihood from 0 to 100. Um, and each of these factors then is scaled from 0 to 1, such that the little, the little number above the dots represents what is the increase in the likelihood to migrate given a movement from the lowest value of the independent variable to the highest value. So let's look at the crime avoidance uh, behavior scale. So we know that um, the lowest value on that is engaging in no crime avoidance behavior. And the highest value is engaging in four such behaviors. So if we move, if we have an individual, we compare an individual who has no such behavior to one that has four such behaviors, having holding all other things constant, that increases the likelihood of migrating by 10 points. Um, and we see then, we can look at what has a positive effect and what has a negative effect. So what decreases um, the likelihood of migrating. So we see that, for example, looking on to the left of that red line, we're looking at the left of the red line. We have trust in the executive. So the more one trusts the executive, the less likely one is to in, to engage in um, in have intentions to migrate. And greater levels of per interpersonal trust also reduce the mig uh, considerations to migrate. On the other hand, we see that crime avoidance behavior, perceptions of neighborhood insecurity crime victimization, and the level of fear that one has about being a victim of homicide all have statistically significant effects on intending intentions to migrate. Likewise, we see at the bottom those factors, those economic factors that are important in these considerations. So unemployment, being unemployed, having a loss in one's household income, and receiving remittances, which is, of course, likely that this uh, individual has family living abroad, are also likely to push one towards considering immigration. And so as a result, um, we can see that both crime and economic factors are important, and that indeed that these crime avoidances, in terms of their magnitude of the behavior, rival those the impact of these, uh, these economic factors. In
in addition to affecting intentions to migrate, those who engage in crime avoidance behavior tend to have less trust in others and in institutions, have been victimized by police corruption, perceive low levels of police responsiveness, but however, they tend to participate more in community organizations. Uh, I'll show you some of the effects here. So if we look at levels of trust, on the left-hand side, the, the um, horizontal, the uh, vertical axis, we see the numbers of behaviors that one um, is like, crime avoidance behavior one will likely in, is engaged in. And so we see those who have fewer levels, uh, lower levels of, um, of crime avoidance behavior have consistently more trust, both in, uh, interpersonal trust and trust in institutions. So, um, whereas those who have high, engage in a number of behaviors uh, have increase, have uh, decreasing levels of, of trust um, across the board. Crime avoidance behavior is also more common when police in locations or where there is a reports of police bribery. So, people who were asked if they were, if a police officer had asked them for a bribe in the last year, um, are more likely to engage in crime avoidance behavior. And those people who are have um, who say that the police are less likely to respond. Um, over an increasing amount of time, um, also are more likely to engage in crime avoidance behavior. Have, so we see that um, in places where, or for people who uh, they say the police will respond in less than 10 minutes, they're much less likely to engage in crime avoidance behavior. And we can think of a lot of reasons why that might be the case. So here's another one of those um, those graphs that I just want to mention uh, with from a regression analysis. And here, our dependent variable, the thing that we want to look at is uh, community participation. So we see here similar that victimization in crime, uh, being a victim of crime in the last 12 one, months, makes one much more likely to engage in community participation. Likewise, engaging in these crime avoidance behavior makes one more likely to engage with the community with community organizations. And I will let um, Michael move on to uh, talk about the um, the policy recommendations. Then that might one might take from this. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Michael? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Yeah, good to go. Can you hear me? Now? One always got the best stuff. So. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome again. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, thank you to Liz and Carol for that very, I think, clear and, and cogent presentation of the, the data in this report. Uh, let me just uh, begin by saying what a pleasure it was for uh, for us to work with you on, on this project. Um, I hope it's the, the start of a long collaboration between uh, the Rule of Law Program and, uh, and LAPOP. Um, this report was literally, uh, I think as we mentioned, years in the making. Uh, and, and I think the, the data that was presented is reflective of the, the careful kind of care and thought that went into to designing the surveys. Uh, and, and I think the, the fresh insights that were mentioned are uh, again, reflective of that. So, so thank you uh, again. Let me also just recognize again Ben Rader's store of my colleague in the in the rule of law program, uh, who's the the primary author on this report. And I think it's it's a, a reflection of his intellect and creativity and commitment to the dialogue's mission of uh, of informing the uh, the policy debate in the Americas in a very serious and, and rigorous way. So we're uh, very grateful for for his contributions. Um, my task is just to walk through some of the policy implications of the the data that, data that you heard about. Um, and 
you all have the report in your hands, so I'll, I'll, I'll go um, fairly, uh, fairly quickly and then turn it over to, to Juan for his thoughts and insights. Um, and let me just say that these are, um, these are meant to start the conversation, not, not exhaust it, uh, that I'm sure as, as others get a hold of the, the data and there's much more than, uh, than what you see here, uh, that, that there will be additional kind of uh, implications and, and insights that, uh, that come out of it. But, but let's, uh, let's put these on the table for discussion as a, as a way, again, to start the conversation. Um, so first of all, this being Washington, there will be a lot of interest in what this says about migration. Uh, and essentially, uh, the data here add to the evidence that migration from the Northern Triangle, and especially from Honduras and El Salvador, is driven uh, to a large degree by concern over crime and fear of violence, uh, as well as the, the economic factors that you mentioned. Uh, this obviously has strong implications as the Trump administration uh, and Congress debate whether to continue investments in the underlying factors in, uh, in these countries uh, uh, and, and, and discuss you know, border security and, and other kind of domestic measures. Um, and, uh, and it suggests that any drop that we're seeing, uh, perhaps temporarily, in, in migration is likely to be uh, temporary uh, and that the underlying push factors um, ultimately are uh, or what, what will matter to, uh, to long-term migration trends. Uh, I think the findings also should lead policymakers in the U.S. and, and also in Mexico, frankly, uh, to take a strong interest in whether Northern Triangle countries themselves are making the investments in Alliance for Prosperity programs that they committed to, uh, to making, uh, and, and if they are not, uh, to, to take uh, the, the requisite diplomatic steps to uh, to ensure that uh, that those commitments are uh, are there in the long term. Um, second, the study I think uh, underscores the economic implications of insecurity. Uh, this is not a new story. The IDB estimates that the impact of crime in the Northern Triangle is already quite staggering: uh, three percent of GDP in Guatemala, six point two percent in El Salvador, six point five percent of GDP in Honduras. Uh, but the data in this survey suggests that, if anything, these numbers may be underestimating the impact, uh, that we see citizens in Central America in significant numbers uh, avoiding purchasing things, uh, changing their jobs or neighborhoods uh, or their study locations, uh, avoiding taking public transport, keeping kids home from schools. Uh, so there's, this suggests, in addition to the kind of direct uh, security costs that the IDB is measuring, that there are a lot of... Uh, economic opportunity costs uh, associated with crime avoidance uh, that, that perhaps we should be, be taking into account. And obviously, that, that has uh, implications for policymakers as they think about the, uh, their investments and how they measure the impact of those investments in security. Um, third, and, and this is something Carol mentioned, uh, I think one of the most intriguing, uh, interesting, perhaps kind of counterintuitive findings of the study is that citizens who engage in crime and avoidance behavior are uh, more active, uh, not less, in their community organizations and their local institutions. Uh, obviously, we need further research to really understand what's going on here and what kind of community engagement is involved. But the data suggests that Central Americans most affected by crime and violence are, are not passive actors, uh, that they are taking measures actively to try to improve their situations at the local level. Uh, and governments and, and development organizations that are are trying to support them uh, and lessen the pressure to migrate would do well to study this phenomenon and support citizens' efforts to build resilient local organizations that can help improve their, uh, their personal uh, citizen security. Fourth, uh, and this is related again to the point about uh, economics, uh, the avoidance of public transport uh, on which many, if not most, citizens in Central America uh, and especially the Northern Triangle uh, are dependent and the tendency to keep children out of school uh, are particularly troubling tendencies with significant long-term impacts on economic productivity uh, and other outcomes. Uh, for policymakers, improving secure access to public transport uh, and schools then seems like an urgent priority. Fifth, we, s we hear a lot nowadays about corruption in Latin America. We think about uh, the La Linea case or the Odebrecht case as, as kind of classic and, and uh, examples of, of grand corruption, uh, you know, major politicians and business figures involved in, in multi-million dollar schemes to, uh, to rob the public treasury. Um, but this study reminds us that 
petty corruption uh, also has a very corrosive effect. Uh, in this case, the impact uh, of police corruption on, on crime avoidance behaviors uh, is very clear. Uh, the implication obviously being that the quality and not the just the, the quantity uh, of policing uh, matters. Uh, so strong vetting, internal controls uh, of policing uh, is essential, uh, and community-based policing models uh, are certainly preferable. Uh, finally, while crime avoidance behavior is high throughout the Northern Triangle, uh, and indeed surprisingly high throughout Central America, uh, even in countries with lower crime rates, the data here do kind of single out Honduras as a particular uh, cautionary tale. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know that the, the homicide rate in Honduras has dropped significantly in recent years from 90 per 100,000 in, in 2012 to 59 per 100,000 in, in 2016. Still very high, but a, a, a significant drop and obviously a welcome one. Um, but the data here show that crime avoidance behavior in Honduras remains the highest in Central America, uh, as does the intention to migrate. Uh, and curiously, there has been a sharp rise in intention to migrate at the same time that we see this drop in homicide rates. Uh, so certainly too, too early to begin uh, declaring victory in, in Honduras, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, migration tendencies and, and intentions. Um, so let me just stop there, uh, having and put these ideas on the table, uh, and turn it over to Juan. Um, Juan is, is a good friend, former colleague, somebody who, uh, whose record of government service includes Peace Corps uh, service in Guatemala, as well as being our, our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central America. So nobody really better place to, uh, to offer some thoughts on, uh, on this report and, and what it might mean for, for policymakers who are thinking about how to, uh, uh, to engage these, these realities in Central America. Juan. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and Michael, for, uh, for having me here. So first, recognizing this is an excellent, excellent presentation by La Pop, um, I applaud you guys put together, but I also wanted to recognize that during the Obama-Biden administration, we actually relied heavily on a three-year Vanderbilt study on the effectiveness of community-based um, crime prevention strategies that emphasized a focus on working with municipal authorities, faith-based organizations, including civic groups, and that actually became um, the driver of a place-based approach that for, um, for the first time actually brought USAID and INL together to see how the hard side and the soft side, so to speak, could actually work together. And, and we saw re results um, in, in many of the communities in a very, I would say, initially in, a, in an isolated scale uh, where we launched pilot projects. And, and because these things take time, we saw a great potential for these, some of these programs to actually be scaled to the national and maybe even regional level. But look, but taking a step back here, um, coming from the U.S. policy approach, I think we've got to recognize that any U.S. policy response to this issue is driven primarily by migration. And we would be in countless NSC meetings where we would talk about the need for development and crime prevention and how you actually sell a bipartisan package to the Hill. And it always came down to the issue of migration and the large numbers of people that were actually coming into the United States. Which is somewhat puzzling because if you if you actually look at, at the numbers in June of 2014, which many of you are aware of, we're actually getting to a place where if there wasn't some sort of response, the numbers were gonna reach roughly 100,000 uh, migrants coming to the southwest border of the United States from, from the Northern Triangle. If you think about it in context, that's not really a, a problem for the United States to absorb, right? Uh, if anything, we've absorbed much larger numbers at different times in our in our history, but but there was a significant political driver domestically in the United States to show that um, that we were actually enforcing um, U.S. borders as uh, as the president was actually looking to con one last push at actually uh, U.S. immigration reform. There was a there was a need and there was a push for us to be very very responsive on the enforcement side. And I'll tell you guys a story when. Uh, I was actually, before being at state as the DAS, I was with um, the special advisor to Vice President Biden for two and a half years on Latin America. And a trip that we took in 2014 to the region that included Brazil, uh, Colombia, and the Dominican Republic, as we were on the trip, we got a call from the West Wing saying, you guys have to go to Guatemala and uh, put together a summit of all the presidents to 
get them to enforce their immigration laws. That was very much a domestic driver. And so Roberta Jacobson, Ricardo Zuno, everybody were kind of putting this trip together as we were jumping into the other countries. And uh, Guatemala hosted it. We sat down, and Vice President Biden started off by saying, look, you guys need to go after the smuggling organizations. You guys need to enforce your borders and know that we're actually going to deploy resources to ensure that we are, uh, our judicial system is moving rapidly and that uh, Customs and Border Protection are, are protecting our borders. And in the course of the conversation that the Vice President had with the leaders, he at one point turned back to us and he said, this is, this is an incomplete. You know, if, if we're actually wanting to have a long-term solution to this issue, we have to make a huge investment in the level of violence and insecurity, or the insecurity and levels of poverty that exist in Central America. Otherwise, we're just going to be dealing with this this issue every single year. And in fact, in 2015, the administration spent, I think it was $5 billion just to the federal government in addressing the flow and migration. And so the cost, prop, the cost proposition was pretty obvious that if you invested, I don't know, $1 billion a year to actually help the region address these issues, that it would be much cheaper than actually addressing um, the festering violence and the, and the flow of, insecure, of uh, migration up to the United States. But when we came back from that trip, um, and again, giving credit, full credit to the Vice President, the, the conclusions that he came to are ones that many of you know, uh, and I've even discussed with you, Joy, um, are that, that the countries of the region don't naturally cooperate with each other. In fact, they're, com they're often competitors. They're historic rivals. Some have actually gone to war with each other. Um, the communities most likely to migrate were historically the most marginalized. and Two more things. First, there's a predatory elite that actually benefited from the current institutional arrangement. Um, and, and lastly, we had a very impatient political process in the United States that wanted results. So the response was pretty clear. The Vice President has worked on Plan Columbia, and I think informed by a lot of the, the work that was done by Vanderbilt, we, we took um, an approach where the US would provide, I mean, this sounds paternalistic, a superstructure to help actually coordinate regional efforts. If the US was at the table, and if we were partnering with Mexico and with Colombia, it would actually help these countries work together to, to develop common, common agendas. The second one was that while we look, needed to look at long-term reforms, the short-term short bridging actions were, were incredibly important to maintain that strategic patience on the part of the US Congress that we had to ask for money. Um, bipartisan support from the Congress was, was key. Um, but more importantly, as opposed to the focus on high intensity law enforcement operations, which may give you tactical victories in the short term, we needed to actually have a much more balanced approach if we wanted strategic victory in, in, the, in the longer term. Um, and then um, finally, there was, and this was actually as a result of a lot of the um, organizations that we consulted here in Washington, that we needed to include a very, very robust multi-stakeholder approach that would allow for the first time um, these governments to sit at the table with civil society organizations and, and with the private sector um, to actually establish um, common priorities. Has it been successful? And, and did what we did, was it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, there, there are so many things, particularly when we were um, in the NSC, uh, working through these issues and, and, and at state as well, the limits, of course, were that US assistance is incredibly, incredibly slow. Um, and, uh, and we actually entered in this scenario where we were continuing to push these leaders for results on issues like tax reform, passing legislation, um, um, you know, implementing anti-money laundering standards. And US assistance was a year behind. And it's just the way that the U.S. assistance process works, and it was, it was difficult to explain to um, even to the Hill that appropriates the funding, but also to White House leadership that we were actually pedaling the bike as fast as we could, but that the bike was broken, and that U.S. foreign assistance needed to be made more effective and flexible to address these sorts of challenges. Um, the second thing we also realized was, um, in addition to the political will necessary to actually rise to the crisis at hand. There was a bandwidth issue as well, where in some of these governments, even I think the most capable and willing, you, you would have 
a minister, a vice minister, they were incredibly great. But as you got farther down in the bureaucracy, they could only handle certain things at, at one time. You couldn't give them a list of 20 things to work on together and actually expect some sort of, some sort of response. Um, and then the last thing, and I think this, is, this puts it into perspective now, is I think in some ways the limits of US anti-corruption efforts. Because I think we can celebrate what has happened in Guatemala with, with the work of CC. I think that's an example of where you have an in, the international community and domestic organizations working together to really combat corruption in a country. But what's the long game here, right, in terms of actually meaningful institutional reforms that, that, that actually prevent presidents from engaging in corrupt behavior? Um, of course, there's drug demand in the United States and the US counter-narcotics policy. Um, but we're at a point right now where, uh, under this administration, of course, the, the overemphasis on enforcement is something that has led to a decline in migration significantly in the first couple months. Actually, between February and March of this year was the first time that migration has decreased in over 17 years. That's according to the Migration Policy Institute, which is striking. So in the short term, deterrence has worked by being with the overly uh, belligerent rhetoric and the overemphasis on, on enforcement. In the long term, I agree with Michael that it's actually not going to work because people that are fleeing violence and that are looking for opportunity are going to either go to Mexico, which has been something that we've seen as well, or they're going to make the journey, journey to the United States. Um, but we're also witnessing right now in the region, I think, a counterattack on anti-corruption efforts, where I think the, the, some of the elements in the region, again, these elites that actually benefit from the current institutional order, are going to test the limits of US response and the response of the US Congress. And I got to say, so far, what's been, really, um, what's been really positive is that that bipartisan consensus in favor of doing something in Central America has held. You've seen uh, leaders like uh, Cardin and Corker working together on these sorts of issues coming out. You've seen uh, uh, Congressman Engel actually filling the void that has actually been left by this administration. But to address the issues in, uh, of violence in Central America and the drivers is something that's going to require, I think, sustained effort across administrations, Republican and, 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 and Democratic. Um, and, uh, and I would make an appeal that, much like Joy and others here, would, would call us every once in a while to tell us what we needed to change and fix, that uh, despite the challenge you may have had in just in dialoguing with this administration, if you're not doing it, uh, nobody else will. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much, uh, Juan. Uh, perspective from the Obama, Biden, Gonzalez, and Camilleri administration. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. We have just about a half hour for, for uh, discussion and comments, so uh, why don't uh, we open it up? I, I just wanted to maybe start by asking Liz, and then we'll just take some others, and if, if there was anything, and Michael Camilleri mentioned a few, in a few times in his remarks about uh, some of the findings that were counterintuitive, that were you know, a little surprising, but um, just to pick up on that, maybe and just to throw it to Liz, who you've had so much experience and and uh, taking these surveys and getting a sense of the public opinion. Uh, from your perspective, was there anything of the results and findings that you found particularly uh, striking or surprising that you didn't expect? So I just would be interested in your perspective and any others who, who along those lines. I mean, if people listen to this and say yes. People avoid crime and they behave in this ways, but you know, uh, it's valuable to have the data to support it. Uh, but that was kind of our impression, you know, that this was this was this was going on anyway. So what what beyond that did we did we learn that that perhaps we didn't expect to learn? Uh, let's start with uh, Rebecca, and then we'll get some other. Yeah, just tell us. There's a microphone right in there, and just tell us. Everybody knows who you are, but just for the one or two who don't, maybe you can tell us your name. Bill Chavez. I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere, so I worked closely with these two. Well, the Chavez administration. The Chavez administration. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, that um, I found most kind of frustrating um, in during the Central America strategy process is that we had the three pillars to the strategy, right? The economics, the governments, govern, governance, and then very important, the security. And here, the emphasis was on the police. And I just found that problem to be almost intractable. Um, you mentioned, um, Liz, that um, 
one of the you know major independent variables for this crime avo avoidance and then ultimately for migration is that this police corruption, the lack of responsiveness of the police. And I think we did things like police vetting, that's great, but it doesn't get at the root problem. Um, and so I'm wondering what we can do, if anyone has suggestions of what we can do differently. I mean, I think that there are other, for example, other actors, regional actors that are helping. I know the Chileans, for example, are working with the Salvadoran police. I know that there are probably lessons learned from Nicaragua with the community policing. Um, but this is just, this was, I found this one of the most troubling questions, and in part because until we do that, we've got the military on the streets, which is very undesi undesirable because the military aren't trained to play this in internal security role. And I heard time and time again from uh, military leaders in Central America, Northern Triangle, we don't relish this role. We want, we want this off-ramp, but we don't see it coming anytime soon because the problems with the police are so entrenched. Thank you. Any other no questions or come? Yes, we have one over that way, and then we'll go to Manuel. Go to Joy. Uh, good morning, Roberto Garcia Saltos uh, from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, I have a, a, a question. Uh, well, first, congratulate for the effort in collecting the data and conducting the survey. The information is very useful. Uh, one thing that strikes me is how to make sense on the dynamics of the data in the sense that, for instance, in Honduras, you see an outcome which is a reduced uh, reduction in homicide rate, but then this perce perception of, of, of crime is still high. So do you have a sense in, in terms of doing this time series analysis of when this perception of um, violence is going to be lower once the results on redu in, in the reduction of, of crime really materialize. Because it's good to have a sense of a perception that insecurity, but then you have outcomes, and the outcome is that homicide rate has fallen. So in a sense, it's not that bad, this, this result, because it's good to have a perception of the insecurity, but it's good to see how this translates into outcomes. And if the outcome is a reduction of homicide rate, so probably we will see in the future that there is going to be a more positive result of this. Thank you. Why don't we go to Joy and then Manuel? Why don't we go to Joy and then we'll we'll do another round? And start. There's a microphone here. No, I think that's a really important observation. This homicide rate and, and the. Uh, intention to migrate, and um, I, I spent a week in June on the north coast of Honduras, and and uh, some time in Ceiba. And one thing I noticed, uh, not noticed uh, in talking to people there, uh, uh, local government employees, the mayor's office, and others hadn't been paid in eight months. Like nobody uh, talk about like not a functioning institution. Um, I was in one community where. Um, when you talk to people there about, like, was there a gang presence and stuff, uh, the answer was no. But the farther you got into the conversation, you realized it was because there was a paramilitary organization that was actually policing that area. <laughs> and uh, so um, so maybe homicide rates were down, but the, like, the place was super dysfunctional. So, um, so yeah, how you break out this, um, uh, the homicide rate is, is it's, it's incredibly important that not as many people are dead, but, um, but uh, functionality in a security, uh, I can see how people weren't feeling any better about it, is I guess my point. My, my other question, I had, oh, I'm question, sorry. sorry. My other question is, um, uh, did you get at the displacement issue? Could you, could you read on that, not just external migration, but uh, how people were uh, displaced? Thanks. Why don't, why don't we start with Liz, and there's some other, we'll do another round um, with Jim and Manuel, and but we'll maybe start with Liz and any other body. Uh, thanks so much. I'll try to just keep my comments uh, brief and hand it on. Um, in terms of what was surprising, I think what was um, maybe not surprising, but really uh, sort of stood out as important is this finding on, on local engagement. Um, we've been talking a lot about it, but I don't think we've really pulled our thinking together. So we've been talking about local engagement in the face of crime in different ways. We have people who are doing research and writing reports on vigilante justice, um, sort of mob, mob justice and community-based organization that 
that doesn't um, sort of operate in a very democratic way. And then we have other people who are who are doing work on you know community involvement with NGOs and and sort of more pro-social, productive, pro-democracy uh, local engagement. What we're finding in the data is that people are primed to engage to address these these problems. We need to do more to understand the you know sort of what what leads to that form of engagement going in one direction versus another. So we see that uh, the the finding that we reported here on increased local engagement in, in the report here in Central America, we also document it in the uh, America's Ramana Regional Report. So it's not something that's just particular to, to Central America. What we're finding in the region is increased local participation. Uh, so I think that's just a, something that's important to, to keep in mind. Um, I'll just briefly say something about uh, the the sort of que the question around the homicide rates, um, I don't have a specific answer other than to say that one of the really great things about an, uh, a national survey in which you ask over 200 questions of people is that you are able to get a much more nuanced uh, understanding of how people are experiencing crime and insecurity. Homicides are often very pocketed. I'm from Chicago, so um, you know that's a great example of a city where homicides are extremely pocketed. They occur mostly on a, a small, small number of blocks. So reducing homicide rates is great, but reducing homicide rates and, and knowing what that national statistic then is doesn't tell us anything about how other communities are being affected by weak institutions, breakdowns in the rule of law, insecurity that comes about in other, other ways. Um, the displacement question, we did ask about whether or not you've intended to or have changed your your place of um, neighborhood. your neighborhood, but it's intention, right? Do you want to say something about that? No. So you, you all have the report in front of you. So, yeah. so some, let me pass this on. So it has changed. Has felt, felt, the need. felt the need to move neighborhoods for fear of of crime and then has changed jobs or study locations. So no, we haven't really looked at internal displacement as a function of, of crime or, or really much. And about LAPOP actually did the uh, evaluation, the fabulous uh, results from the how people were responding, but I, I know it's available. in Central America. I'll leave that. Option policy as it, as it applies to the region. Um, you know, the Summit of the Americas next year will focus on this, this issue of democratic governance against corruption. And um, no, just speaking to, to current administration officials, they're much, very much focused on this in a, um, maybe unsurprisingly, in the context of, uh, of these security questions. Um, and 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 in doing so, they're looking at you know transnational organized crime and the, um, the 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 criminal elements that have a tend to have a corrupting effect on on public institutions. But but I think you know this this data here suggests that um, if the U.S. is is investing in uh, citizen security and and building uh, more effective uh, police forces in uh, in the Northern Triangle, that it would do well to to see. Uh, you know, internal controls and, and uh, you know, not just expanded or, or effective, uh, but also sort of clean and, and accountable um, police forces as, as a critical kind of part of that, uh, that U.S., um, not just anti-corruption, but broader uh, policy for the region. Um, I think the question about uh, Honduras and what we see was, was addressed, but um, maybe just to, to wildly hypothesize a little bit more, um, you know, one of the interesting things in this uh, in the study is um, that it takes us beyond just what people sort of feel about about insecurity. So the one of the things this report says is that individuals in Honduras and Uruguay um, have similar rates in in terms of their perception of of crime and insecurity as the primary problem in their country. Uh, obviously very different realities in the two countries. So if you look at, when you look at crime avoidance behavior, it actually tells you a lot more than simple kind of perception of the problem. Um, and, uh, and I think the same goes probably for when we look at, at crime avoidance behavior um, versus homicide rates. Obviously homicide rates tell you something important, um, but if we look at what happened, for example, during the gang truce in El Salvador, um, 
homicide rates certainly dropped, but other forms of crime, whether it's extortion or gang recruitment, uh, assaults, robbery, um, all of those things that, that very much impact individuals' lives and may take them and lead them to take certain uh, certain forms of behavior, uh, if anything, you know, may have increased during, during that period. So, um, you know, murder rates tell us something, but they don't tell us necessarily the full story. Thanks, Juan. So briefly on the security, I think there's a, the best case example to look at is Guatemala. Um, and I would take, I mean, in some ways, the argument that the police is not ready to actually tackle the challenges is, I, I take that with the, some skepticism in the, in the sense that for the longest time, the Guatemalan military has actually avoided turning over that responsibility and used that as an excuse. Um, the Guatemalan military has an outsized role in the, in the government. Um, they are actually recognized in the Constitution, and the police is not. Uh, they have very, very robust training and professionalization opportunities for, for, for people that join the military. Those same opportunities is, it, do not exist in, in the police. And so um, under, I, I hate keep, as a former official, when we, uh, in the Obama-Biden administration, one of the conversations that we kept having with the Guatemalans was, when are they actually going to start doing the transfer? And it was a slow and arduous process to actually make those sorts of investments. But even simple things like passing, passing legislation that would um, recognize the police for the duties that it has, um, to actually create um, academies, uh, even at the regional level, to professionalize the police. Um, is something that is has met some resistance. I think it's 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 something that's starting to move, that is moving, but it's but it could move so much so much faster for them to actually fill that fill that space. And I and I actually got to say that the, we had these debates um, about the usefulness of of U.S. international narcotics and law enforcement assistance, and a lot of um, critics would label that assistance as the militarization of U.S. assistance to Central America, but the reality is that. That, the majority of that money didn't go to Blackhawks and, 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 and whatnot, but it went to training uh, police academies, obviously vetted units, supporting coordination between US law enforcement and, um, and regional law enforcement. And so in, in that regard, I think it's been a, a positive tool for change. And it has to be sustained. Overnight, it's something that what we see in the case of Colombia, um, as Colombia enters this peace process, the question that everybody's asking themselves is, can the police fill the space left by the military? And they're getting there, but they, after 15 years of playing Columbia and then working toward this, it's something that they're just now actually able to achieve. I think it's gonna take Central America much longer, but it's gonna require external pressure for them to switch the emphasis from the military to the police as the guarantor of domestic security. Thanks, we'll get three final questions. Jim, uh, let me get the microphone here. Okay, thanks, uh, Jim Michael. Uh, Former, uh, in terms of everything in uh, <laughs> America, um, the tendency of people to want to emigrate. Uh, you had one of your charts that showed this was throughout Central America on the increase. I've done studies and assessments in other Latin American countries where you find similar uh, tendencies, and they're supported in your uh, your own reports. Uh, yet, I think if you were to look at border apprehensions, you would find that it is the Northern Triangle countries where people act on that intention more. And that seems to suggest that fear is a more urgent and significant motivator than opportunity. People leave because they wanted an economic opportunity, and they will tell you in Ecuador or the Dominican Republic or Peru that uh, they want they want to move because uh, of the opportunity, but when fear is the motive, it seems to me you have a stronger uh, impulse to to leave, and I wonder if that is not something that can be used effectively in our political dialogue in this country, in trying to encourage a more coherent and comprehensive response to the situation in the region because you don't get rid of fear by technical assistance to the police. It's a much broader economic and, and diplomatic uh, and, uh, and, and supported by assistance, but a much broader thoughtful engagement and 
as Juan said, it's, it's one that requires some consistency over time, some sustainable effort. And uh, I just wonder if that motivator of fear is something that might not be used to spark the debate a little bit here. Thanks. Sir, do you have a question? Come here, please, right here. Hi, good morning. My name is Gilberto Amaya. I'm from Honduras, but also just came from El Salvador to do some work there with USAID projects. And uh, my question is if you have come across any local initiative like the El Salvador Seguro, for example, that is a multi-stakeholder uh, approach in El Salvador to curb violence and address the insecurity issues, and how effective you consider that is, and if it can be replicated in the other countries. Of the Thank Triangle. you. Thank you. Yes, in the back, and then we'll go to Manuel. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Roberto Bando from PEDF. I would like to know if you have uh, any findings that show um, significant differences uh, between gender, age groups, and um, ethnicity in the countries where you have a different type of population, including ind ind indigenous communities. Thanks. Manuel? Yeah, you, just, just a brief question. This is Manuel Orozco, who's the program director of the Sorry. dialogue. Yeah. The American dialogue. Um, the, the study is an excellent uh, statistical exercise on, on looking at Central America, not just the Northern Triangle. And, and it seems to be striking to raise a question that sometimes we take for granted. But what is the significance of measuring the perception of insecurity and crime? Um, because when I actually look at the data, the elephant in the room is not the Northern Triangle, but it's actually Central America and the other countries, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Panama, in the sense that if crime avoidance is reflecting one in 10 for the Northern Triangle, that it does, you don't avoid you know, something for, for the Costa Ricans, Nicaraguans, and Panamanians is two in 10. Now, in reality, there is a, a misbelled difference in terms of crime statistics between these two regions. So, you know, Costa Ricans, to a large extent, may be feeling as insecure sometimes as Hondurans. Um, so, it, you know, it begs the question to, to wonder, you know, what, what is the significance of insecurity um, along those lines? Thanks. Why don't we uh, go back to our, our speakers? Why, may we start with Juan, Michael, Carol, and we'll end with Liz. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think just maybe I'll comment on, sir, on your question in terms of the examples. For, for us, very, very briefly, um, so we used El Salvador as an example for a lot of the stuff that we did in Honduras and Guatemala. It started out, as, as you may know, as the partnership for, for growth, where we didn't have the money behind it, but we had the planning. Uh, and, uh, and it actually became a model. We, we had the USAID uh, mission was incredibly effective at coordinating um, with the rest of the country team from the embassy. And uh, they convinced the folks here in Washington that it couldn't be a Washington-led process. You actually had to empower uh, the embassy on the ground to make some of the programmatic decisions. And the work that they did with Partnership for Growth and the support for El Salvador Seguro was something that we tried to replicate in Honduras and in Guatemala in terms of the multi-stakeholder model. And in Guatemala, I forget what the multi-stakeholder model in Guatemala was called, but uh, what we learned very quickly was that it, it took a lot of time to get the multi-stakeholder model right. Because the default was for the strongest kind of players at the table to have the largest voice, in that case being the private sector, uh, informing a lot of what the Guatemalans and the Hondurans did. And then over time, they would work to integrate more of the of the community, um, but I would say that we used El Salvador and, um, and Plan Seguro El Salvador as the as the example. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'll be quick too. I think most of the questions were about the the data sets. Um, just uh, to this point that I think Jim and, and Manuel raised about the other countries and in, in Central America, I think there's there's certainly a lot there to, to kind of think through, and you've posed some some important questions. Uh, the one thing that I'd, I'd sort of note is just that. Um, Migration from Nicaragua, of course, historically has been um, heavily focused on Costa Rica. So, not necessarily the case that that all the migration from uh, from these these regions comes to to our southern border. And and, and I think increasingly, and you know, Juan mentioned this as well, um, that that Mexico, I, I think, will be uh, a place that that is dealing with these uh, with folks wanting to stay and asking for asylum and uh, and having to uh, uh, to face this challenge and. 
and hopefully taking a you know more of an interest in, in Central America and, and the Northern Triangle for that reason. Thanks, Carol. Any thoughts? I just want to um, mention um, for the question about the uh, the data analysis uh, by different sectors, so uh, and different gr subgroups. So we did do. Um, an anal we did look at some of these crime avoidance behavior by gender, by, uh, by age group cohorts. We, in the report, we show quintiles of wealth, for example. Um, there wasn't much difference with regard to, uh, to gender. Uh, a little bit of difference on some of the indicators with regard to urban and rural uh, behavior. Um, we looked at uh, the, the Difference, for example, sending your children to school, whether this had a disproportionate impact in, in one sector than in the other. I don't think there was as large of a difference as we had, had expected to see. Um, we were not able, we don't have ethnic group breakdowns in these countries, um, I don't think, right? Uh, not in Central America. We have self-identification. We have skin tone and self-identification only on four cat as indigenous, but not in not among we don't have oh, a dis right. we don't distinguish among specific indigenous groups uh, in this particular survey. Um, so I haven't done those analysis at, by in by uh, racial groupings, um, for example, but um, it's certainly something that one could look at. Um, and and like I said, the, this data will be up, is up on our website, um, so you can download it and um, and you know use our online analyzer to break those down by subgroups if desired. Thank you. Liz, final word. Well, I just want to say thank you. I thought all the comments were really spot on in terms of pointing to key topics that we need to investigate further and think more about and drawing out this uh, dialogue on the topic. So thank you all. And I just want to echo what Carol said to remind you all that the data are available on our website. You can pull up the questionnaire. You can pull up the sample design. You can pull up all sorts of information about the study in our comparative report, but you can also dive into the data um, the question that was posed about sort of what's the significance of the levels that we see in one country versus another, I think that gets to the, the crux of why we think the America's Barometer is a useful tool, which is we don't necessarily know when high is high until we can compare it to something that's lower, right? So it may be that it's not atypical for women in a lot of societies, uh, including our own, to report that in the last year, they've avoided you know, leaving their house alone at night for fear of crime, right? So we should expect there to be something there. And then what we can do with the comparative project is see, wow, where is it much higher than that sort of maybe average middling level that we see in a standard country that you know doesn't experience the same levels of crime and violence as the countries that we're focused on. So um, I'll just end it there. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, I think this has been a, a terrific uh, discussion. I want to thank all of you for coming and for your great questions and comments. And uh, we look forward to having you back at the dialogue. Many thanks to Juan for uh, his great comments. Michael, thank you. Uh, Carol and Liz. And of course, Ben, again, who did everything. Uh, and uh, so we thank you for your, for your great contribution to this, Ben, and for really pushing us hard to this. I think it's been very successful. And we really hope to sustain and, and expand our partnership uh, with LaPop. Uh, you do wonderful work. And I think that's a lot more, uh, I think the, uh, the takeaway of this session is that there's a lot more work to be done um, to looking at public opinion in, in this Central America and elsewhere in Latin America. And we look forward to our uh, continued collaboration. So thank you very, very much for doing this. Thank you to all. Good.